She's in pretty bad shape. And how's her pulse? It's down to 52. That's not good. Have her in surgery in 10 minutes. Yes, doctor. Any identification? Just a name. Kitty Travers. Nothing else. Okay, we'll start with that. Kitty Travers? Wait a minute. Do you know her, doctor? No, but I remember reading about her in the paper some time ago. She must have just been released. Released? Yes, from prison. Hope I'm not putting you out too much, Mr. Barker. Guess I shouldn't have come here asking you about Kate, uh, I mean Kitty. That's all right, Mr. Player. You know, when I saw her picture on this piece of music, I phoned the publisher's office and they told me where I'd find you. Uh -huh. Cream? Sugar? No, thanks. I take it straight. Guess I was just plain lucky seeing this piece in the window. Clerk told me you wrote it more than three years ago. Yes, that was my first published song. Came near being my last. Uh, and you knew Kate? I mean, Kitty then? Yes, I knew her. You must have met her right after she packed up and ran away. Never even left us a note. And you say you haven't heard from her since? Not a thing. We were pretty badly broken up about it, especially my wife. You see, we lost our son in the war, and Kitty's all we have left now. That is, all I have left. My wife, she passed away about a year ago. Oh, I'm sorry. That's why I'm so anxious to locate a, a Kitty, as she calls herself now, wherever she is. Would you like a cigarette? Or a cigar, maybe? Cigar, if you don't mind. Doctor says I should ease up on smoking, but I guess one cigar won't hurt. Huh? Well, I don't think that'll do you any harm. Hope they're still fresh. Oh, you... Thank you, Mr. Barker. Call me Dan, won't you? All right, Dan. Why don't you tell me where Kitty is, instead of making me hint and beat around the bush? I haven't seen her for a long time, Mr. Klinger. Over two years. Still holding out, ain't you? Look, son, maybe you think I'm a prying old man, but you must have been awful close to my daughter. What makes you say that? You wrote a song for her. How come? It all began back in Mrs. Nesbitt's rooming house. At that time, I was in love with a girl who was staying there. Kitty? No, it wasn't Kitty. It was Linda. She was a cashier in a restaurant. Used to work until 3 o'clock in the morning. When she came home at night, she usually found me at the piano because I was busy trying to... Write. Hello, Dan. Oh, hello, darling. Don't tell me it's 3 o'clock already. It's 3.15. Sure. Did you finish the song in the second act? Yes, I did, believe it or not. It turned out pretty well. You want to hear it? Mm -hmm. Listen. Keep it down. All right, all right. Well, 
What's the verdict? I like it. It has a lot of warmth and tenderness. So have you, darling. I hope the show will be your big break, Dan. I hope so. You make the grade, I know it. Well, all we need is a little luck, honey. Gee, I'm tired. And I've got an early appointment with a dentist. Are you going to work some more? Oh, sure. I've got to get started on that second act finale. Good night, then. Good night, darling. Nearly seven. All the others are getting up now. Getting ready for work. Well, what do you think I've been doing all night? Oh, I know. I know. Composing. But what does it get you? I'm going to get a break. You'll see. I can feel it coming now, any day. And the first thing I'm going to do is get some money. Uh-huh. You're going to pay your board. Dan, why don't you come down to earth? Why didn't you stick to selling shoes? People can't do without shoes, but they can fiddle without your tunes. Now, don't say that. Sooner or later, everybody has to pay the fiddler. Well, then the fiddler pays me, I pay you, and there we are. Yeah, but just now, we aren't anywhere. To bed with you. Get some sleep. Get, get, get. What will Jim say when he learns that Norma has married for money when she could have found love? Who cares? It's seven o'clock in the morning. Good morning. Good morning. What can I do for you, young lady? I'd like to see Mrs. Nesbitt. Well, you're looking at her. I wrote you about a room. Helen Drake recommended your place to me. Oh, of course. Come right in. So you're Kate Klinger? No, not anymore. Let that name in Pleasant Prairie, Minnesota. Changed it to Kitty Travers for professional reasons. Oh, you've got a profession? Well, not yet exactly, but I hope to have. Helen wrote me not to worry about a thing. Let's hope she's right. When I came to the city 30 years ago, I knew exactly this was what I was going to do. Oh, excuse me. Now what? I left my cigarettes on the piano. Well, all right, but don't you be smoking in bed and burning the house down. I'll be down before breakfast. All right. What was that? That was Dan Barker. Writes music. For no money so far. Works all night and in the morning he's too sleepy to know what he's doing or saying. No, I could see that. Now about the rent. No, I know. It's $28 a week including breakfast and dinner. That's right. I've got the receipt all made out. Oh, that's fine. It's payable in advance. I'll uh, have to get to a bank first. Open an account. Well, there's a bank right in the next block. But it wouldn't be open yet. Well, uh, come along. I'll show you your room. Breakfast is at 8. Well, yes, I think I did. I can't quite make my mind about that. Oh, very good. Folks, this is Kitty Travers. Just flew in from Minnesota. This is Mr. Dumont. Ms. Travers, it's a pleasure. And are you sure you... Uh, Mrs. Cosgrove, do do Irving here? Miller, Mary do? Simpson, and this is Linda Ware. Hello, welcome to the family. Thanks. This will be your place, Kitty. So you come from the Middle West, Miss Travis? Yes. Did you have a nice trip? Yes. A young, beautiful girl like you has to be very careful. There's so many wolves around. The young wolves I like. And the old ones don't scare me. Morning, everybody. Morning, sweetheart. Good morning, Dan. You look tired this morning. Oh, Mr. Barker, I love that tango you played last night. It was a waltz. Oh, it was so relaxing it put me to sleep. Well, thanks for the compliment. Would you care for some... Oh, I beg your pardon. I'm Dan Barker. Thank you so much for noticing me, Mr. Barker. I'm Kitty Travers. And uh, I'll have a piece of toast. Look all the time. <laughs> Would you mind passing the cream, Mr. Baker? The cream? Certainly. I hate to bother you, Mr. Baker. Uh, Barker. Mr. Barker. He's only half awake. I wanted the cream, if you don't mind. Oh, not at all, not at all. I'll get it for you. Oh, the cream. Thank you. I'm sorry, Miss... Uh... Travis. Travis. 
All he thinks about is his music. Well, I think I shall attend tomorrow. You got 043896. Miss who? Kate Klinger. There's nobody here by that name. Wait, it's for me. Oh, hold it. Said Klinger. Hello? Oh, hello, Helen. Yes, I got in at six. I'd have called you, but I didn't think you'd be up yet. Hold it a minute, Helen. Do you mind stopping your concert for just a minute, Mr. Baker? Barker. Baker or Barker, I still can't hear. Sorry. Hello, Helen. Now that that noise has stopped, what were you saying? Sure. Sure, I'll be there as soon as the taxi can bring me. Mm -hmm. Bye. They fit perfectly, Helen. They're like new. I haven't worn them half a dozen times. You can have these, too. Shoes are very important. Some men pay more attention to shoes than to the dresses a girl wears. Let's see, you'll need some smart outfits. I told Bob Lacey so much about you. Your figure, how elegant you are. Really gave you quite a build-up. Try this. You have a date to be in Lacey's studio at 11. I hope you explain that I've never worked for a commercial photographer. I did not. There isn't much to it. I can teach you all I know about it. And I've done all right. You certainly have. Modeling's done you a lot of good. <laughs> not the modeling, honey. The alimony. Nice gentleman saw my picture in a fashion magazine. You were married? And divorced. My lawyer, Bert Crail, got me the divorce and a nice alimony. Now I don't have a thing to worry about, except collecting it. Needs a little tightening about here. The only modeling I do now is for fun. It's pin money for me. Well, how soon do you think I can earn some money? You broke? Completely. I'll let you have a few dollars. Thanks. Let's see. You'll need this bathing outfit, too. Standard equipment for models. Over here, Miss uh, Kitty. Now, here's what I want to show. You feel like a million dollars because you're wearing a Swanson outfit. Your boyfriend has just left to get you a Coke and a hamburger. He looks back, and you wave at him. <laughs> Got it? Yes, I <laughs> guess I can. I'll try. Yeah, take your wrap off. And sit on the arm of the chair and wait. I wish you could see yourself stiff as a board. <laughs> How Helen Gray could call you a sensational model, I'll never know. Well, if you just let uh, me... Uh, don't interrupt. Don't give me that frozen smile. Loosen now. Let me see just one little reaction. Now wave. Naturally. No, I said naturally. Give me something. Now wave naturally, Mr. Lacey. Burke, what's up? Invite well, us in, we'll talk about it. Sure, come on in. Thank you. This is Mike Hadley, a private detective. We have to change the combination. Nice meeting you, Mr. Hadley. Likewise. Sit down. Mike is the president of the Ajax Detective Agency. Marital investigations are specialty. I get it. I need you, honey. I need you badly. It's a Donovan divorce case. We've got everything set up for tonight. The hotel room, the photographer, and Mike here. But the gal we were going to use is taking a runout powder. Now, Mrs. Donovan is willing to pay plenty. I thought that perhaps... Hold everything, Bert. You know I don't remember that sort of stuff anymore. Well, who said anything about you? I thought perhaps you might think of a girlfriend that'd like to pick up a quick 250 bucks tonight. No, not offhand. Well, why come to me? You know more people than I do. Hi. What happened to you? Nothing, absolutely nothing. Excuse me a minute. Come on, darling, tell me all. My modeling career just went right out the window. Lacey nagged me to distraction and then tried to manhandle me. Then what? I slugged him. Oh, you really fixed things good, didn't you? Mm-hmm. Well, if you'll just lend me bus fare, I'll go back to Minnesota and forget all about everything. Don't take it so hard. Something else will turn up. In fact, something else has turned up. Darling, I won't have to lend you a dime. Your big break is right out there in my living room now. 
How would you like to earn $250 for an hour's work? What am I supposed to do, kill somebody? We'll see. Come on. Kitty, I want you to meet my lawyer, Bert Crail. This is Mr. Hadley. Hi. Kitty Travers. Kitty would like to work with us. What kind of work? Oh, just a little legal chore. Almost the same as modeling, only you don't have to get your face in the camera. All right. Who is it? Mr. Donovan. Miss Harper? Yes, come in, please. Be seated, Mr. Donovan. I understand that you have some startling information about my wife. I have. Believe me, I have. Kiss me, darling. What's the meaning of this? The judge will ask you that same question in court, Mr. Donovan. This is terrible. Look, Mr. Klinger, maybe you'd rather not hear the rest of it. I want to hear the truth. All of it. Okay. Well, I didn't see a lot of Kitty at first. Joe Wood, that's my agent, had just submitted my musical show to a producer. And I was waiting to hear from Joe. Hello? Who? No, there's no Joe Wood here. Oh, you're Joe Wood. Yes, that's me. <laughs> I want to speak to Dan Barker. Mr. Barker's not in. This is Kitty Travers. May I take a message? Mm. Is Linda there? Oh, oh. Uh, Miss Travers, tell Danny Boy that his show is in a bag and he'll be soon rolling in money. Yes. Evan Fisher is all set to sign the contract. And, and, and Miss Travers, tell Danny to be in my office not one minute later than five o'clock. Yes, I'll be sure to tell him when he comes in, Mr. Wood. Bye. Hello. Hello, Mr. Wood? Oh, Mr. Barker, you're just a second too late. For what? <laughs> Use my informal attire. I jumped out of the tub to answer the phone. Your agent called. He said your show's in the bag. What? You sure you heard right? Yes. He said a producer named Fisher is ready to sign. Mr. Wood wants you to come and see him at 5 o'clock. Oh. Well, what's the matter? Don't you like being a success? Oh, sure. Think of all that nice money. But, well, after all, nothing's final yet enough good news for one day. Now, if I were you, I'd go out tonight and celebrate. To begin with, I'd get myself a wonderful dinner. Steak, three inches thick. Then I'd go dancing. Forget all about work. Oh, Linda works every night, you know that. Now, come, Mr. Dan Barker. Don't tell me a nice guy like you can't find a girl to go out with. Then I suppose it's none of my business. I guess I'm just a dreamer. But if I were you, I'd be dreaming about a nice, cozy penthouse big Cadillac convertible and a yacht. You know I'd love to go fishing just once on a nice clean yacht. Well, you're more than welcome to come along on my yacht. Well, to get all those things, that's just a dream. That's how dreams are made. Maybe I could help you write more musicals or a, a hit song. I could be your, um... Inspiration? Yes, your inspiration. Whenever you had an opening of a new show, I'd be sitting in a box in a gorgeous evening gown and wish. Hard. And then your show would turn out to be a big success. You know, I have a lucky star and get everything I wish. Would you believe that, Dan? Yes, Kitty. I would. You know, it's funny. I think I'm actually seeing you for the first time. Do you like what you see? If I said no, I'd be lying. It takes courage to say that to a girl who's just washed her hair. You're sweet. Hardly giving me a glance. Sometimes one glance is enough. I'll never forget the first time I saw you. Your hair all mussed up. You were cute. Fact is, I liked you from that very first day. Of course, up to now, I've had no response. What? The fellow doesn't know. What? What? You know a lot about music, Dan Barker. But you know very little about women. Oh, Dan, isn't it wonderful? I start 
stopped by Joe's office and he told me all about the show. Yeah, it's the break I've been waiting for. You got a cigarette on you, honey? Sure. Thank you. Well, now I can really begin planning things. Oh, yes, Dan. It's been nice here, and Mrs. Nesbitt's been swell, but... You know that new apartment building up the street? You mean the one with the balconies around it? That's the one. Yeah. And I'm fed up with buses and streetcars. That blue convertible we were looking at the other day. Dan, that was a Cadillac. Well, so what? I'm not going to write just one musical show. But, Dan, a Cadillac. That's a long way off yet. Well, first you need some new shirts, a, a new suit. Oh, let's be practical, darling. Practical? It's all I ever hear, be practical. I'm an artist, Linda. I can't be practical all the time. Oh, I gotta run. I have to meet Joe at five. I'll see you. And then I said, listen, gentlemen. Even if it is his first show, he doesn't have to sell it for peanuts. He's not interested in no minimum royalties because I, Joe Wood, won't let him be interested. And if you don't like our terms, it's just too bad. Look, Joe, aren't we being a little brave? After all, they might get sore and lose interest. Well, how do you like that? You think Joe's an income pop? Income poop. All right, all right, poop pop. But we got plenty of reasons to be brave, plenty. Look here, this is a strictly inside though. Irvin Fisher has signed Mary Fulton for the lead. Get it? Yeah. And Mary Fulton has the right to okay the show, right? Yeah, that still doesn't mean she will. Uh-huh, so, so what do you know? Mary Fulton has declared, I quote, either I play Marie in Dan Barker's show or nothing at all, unquote. Oh, Joe, is that on the level? Is that on the level? Sit down, Sonny boy. Danny, I don't tell fairy tales. I know it from Melissa. She's Irvin's secretary. It cost me a couple of pounds of candies, chocolate with uh, marshmallow inside, three fifty, and just an investment, but was worth it. We are in, Sonny boy. All you have to do is sign right here. I can't believe it. I still wish we had Fisher's signature. Danny, please, let me do the wording. He will come crawling, begging me, please, to let him sign. Greetings, darling. Hiya. What are you bubbling over about? Sit down, dish me the dirt. Remember the voice of warning, Hollis, I was telling you about? The one who writes music? Mm-hmm. I think I'm going to marry him. But you said he's broke. Yes, but right now he's teetering on the brink of success, and I'm going to push him over. The musical show he's been slaving over is going to be produced on Broadway. No. Has he proposed? No, but he will, and very soon. Of course, he doesn't know it yet. But he's taking me out tonight. I seem to remember you mentioned a girl he was going to marry. How come he isn't taking her out? She's working late. You know, the sense of duty type. <laughs> You're really in love with the guy? I think so. Where's he taking you tonight? I don't know. Why can't we celebrate here? You could serve him a home-cooked dinner. I'll even lend you a gingham apron to complete the illusion. Songwriters are pushovers for gingham girls. Well, that's sweet of you, but I sort of had an idea I'd like to be alone with him. Okay, I'll go see a movie. Thanks, Helen, you're a real friend. Always glad to smooth the path of true love. Mm, here's another little tip. After the gingham apron routine, don't let him help you do the dishes. Men don't like it, even though they pretend to. Turn on the record player and relax. That soft, light, sweet music stuff, it never fails. So I heard. Come on. Uh, um, Mrs. Nesbitt? Mrs. Nesbitt, let me speak to Dan, please. Celebrating? He should be celebrating in a time like this. Uh, where is he? Where did he and Linda go? I don't know where he went, and he didn't take Linda with him. He took Kitty Travers. He's celebrating without Linda. Why? How should I know? This isn't information, please. Do you want me to tell Dan something? Yes. I mean, no. I'll tell him myself. Have him call me in the morning. Please. Celebrating. Now, I can help you with the dishes. Oh, no, you don't, darling. Relax. I don't like a man doing a woman's work. Anyway, this evening's much too short to waste. I'll be back in a jiffy. This is your 
8 o'clock weather report. Hudson River Valley, north of Poughkeepsie, overcast with slight ground fog for early morning, clearing towards late afternoon. Weather in the Catskills, fair and warmer as the day progresses. You could have picked a more comfortable place to Probable sit. Probable rain tomorrow evening. Why don't you come over here? You know, you baffle me. I do? Yes, and I hate being baffled. Come here. I want to show you something. Look at that face. What's wrong with it? Everything, Mr. Sobersides. This is your night to howl. Let yourself go and look at you. I'm sorry. It's the only face I've got. And it's a very nice face, too. When you don't look like you were carrying all of the world's problems on your shoulders, or like you were afraid of someone. Close your eyes a minute. What for? I want to see what you look like when your eyes aren't sad like a conquer spaniel. Go ahead, close them. What are you laughing at? You're funny. <laughs> You've no idea. No, darling. Good night, Dan. Yes, it's almost one. You must be dead tired, darling. I'll see you at breakfast in the morning. Dan, do you, do you have to tell Linda tonight? I'm going to make a clean breast of it now. Couldn't you tell her tomorrow? Well, I think it's better like this. But you might change your mind overnight. Not a chance. Good night, sweetheart. Good night, Dan. Did I frighten you? Oh, why? You practically jumped out of your skin when I spoke to you. Um, Linda, sit down a minute, will you? There's something I've been wanting to tell you. Yes, Dan? I, uh, 
I've been thinking a lot about you lately, Linda. About us. And I've made a decision. I regret it someday, but I made up my mind. Dan, you make it sound like such a dangerous adventure. I don't think either of us will ever regret it. Uh, no, no, Linda. What, what I'm trying to say is... Well, I don't think it would work out for us. I don't think we'd be a good team. Of course, we'll always be friends. Good friends. It means it's all over. Don't believe me, Linda. It's the best thing for both of us. It's just... Don't say any more, Dan. Always been honest with me. Let's keep it that way. People get happy about the strangest thing. Well, shouldn't a guy be happy when he's going to marry the most wonderful girl in the world? So you and Linda are going to get hitched. No, not Linda. Her name's Kitty Travers, and she's really something. She must be, to break up you and Linda after all these years. Oh, Linda's a grand girl. I'll always think the world of her. Well, we've known each other ever since we were kids, but Kitty's different. She can really inspire me to... You're going to need a lot of inspiration, Dan. Well, that's no way to talk to a guy who's sitting on top of the world. Boy, am I hot. Last night I wrote the greatest song ever put on paper. Take a look at that. Sure, sure. Sit down in that chair, Dan. I gotta cool you off much as I hate to. I would rather lose my right arm than tell you this. Dan, the whole deal is off. Well, I don't get it. Mary Fulton cracked up in her car and won't be out of the hospital for months. I haven't tried to sign up Norma Houston, but she's tied up, so Irvin is not going to stage the show this year. All my work for nothing. All my plans. Now, let's not lose our heads. Let's talk it over. Maybe we can think of something. Some other time, Joe. I'll call you. Maybe tomorrow. Bye, Dan. Gertrude. Gertrude. Yes? Yeah? Hold all calls, and I don't want to see anybody either. Kitty, that's how dreams are made. Good. Get me Paul Ricardo. waited and where's it gotten me i'm fed up with it kitty only last night she last said night we had a future to look forward to what have we got today for oh, one little setback that doesn't need to end everything 
told me you loved me. All right, I told you. So I made a mistake. Let's forget the whole thing and call it quits. You'll probably be a lot better off with Linda anyway. Maybe she likes being poor and worrying all the time. I don't. Okay, okay. So I made a mistake, too. And that song I wrote for you, I'll burn it. I never want that one published. Don't worry. It hasn't got a chance. Publishers aren't that stupid. That doesn't sound like my daughter. Well, anyway, she knocked me right off my little pink cloud that night. What was left of it. And when I came down to Earth, only one thing seemed important. I had to get Linda back. Linda. Do you have a minute? Yes. I'd like to talk to you. What is there to talk about? I know I haven't any right to ask you this, but do you think you could forgive a guy like me? Don't you realize how much you've hurt me? Yes, and I feel awful about it. But you've got to forgive me, Linda. Please. Oh, Dan. You have just heard, Kitty, That's How Dreams Are Made, which is leading our parade of favorites for the sixth consecutive week. That puts the name of Dan Barker right among the year's most successful songwriters. And now for our sponsor. How do you like that? Dan Barker. He must be making a fortune with that song. You were silly to give him the brush off so fast. It only gave Linda the green light. Now well, she's cashing in instead of you. It's Mrs. Linda Barker instead of Mrs. Kitty Barker. What burns me up, he owes all of his success to me. I gave him the idea for the words and the music. And what am I getting out of it? Nothing. It's your own fault, honey. You had all the trump cards. Could have had a more pleasant life than staying here with me and doing those occasional modeling jobs. I wonder what would happen if the publishers knew I was Dan's inspiration girl. Say, that might be interesting. Take a good look at me. I might even be the next Mrs. Dan Barker. This was the beginning. When Kitty went to the publisher, he insisted that her picture be on all the music. He claimed it would sell more copies. And did it? Yes, I guess so. That's what Dan says. And since then, all I hear, all I read is Kitty, Kitty, Kitty. Interviews, Dan and Kitty. Photographs, Kitty admiring Dan, Dan adoring Kitty. Radio shows, public appearances. They have to go out together, they have to travel together. All for the sake of business. And tonight, they're... Did you see the papers? You mean that shindig at the 400 Club? Yes, with Kitty Travis to sing and Dan at the piano. Oh, my miss, but I'm losing, Dan. Now, now, maybe it's not that bad. After all, Dan should have learned his lesson. Fady hasn't. We were so happy, the way I always dreamed it would be. Dan was so sweet. We were making plans for the future. Didn't realize then that all this was made possible through the success of that song. A song that idolized a girl who took Dan away from me once before. Oh, that Kitty Travers is a no-good so-and-so. Maybe I have too much pride, but this business with Kitty has reached a point where I, I have to make a decision. You're not going to leave Dan. Perhaps I should before he leaves me. Now you listen to me, Linda Barker. You're not going to run out on Dan and leave that, that sheep hire at a clear field. That's the trouble with marriage nowadays. Too many women are ready to run at the first sign of trouble. It's all wrong. You love Dan, don't you? You know I do, my husband. Well, then you're staying right here. Because if he's worth loving, he's worth fighting for. But what can I do? I'm going to have a baby. Why, Linda, that's wonderful. Wait till Dan hears. I'm not going to tell him I can't. I don't want to win him back that way. Well, there ought to be some way of bringing Dan to his senses. Say, it's 10 o'clock. Let's get that nightclub on the radio. Oh, I'd rather not. I don't... Oh, don't be silly. Turn it on.
Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And now, as the cannibal chief said to his cook, whom are we having for dinner tonight? <laughs> know the tune. So meet the composer, Dan Barker. <laughs> and the lovely lady who inspired him to write the song, Miss Kitty Travers. They're applauding the hussy. Some inspiration, if I may say so, without getting my face slapped. It's a wonder the guy didn't write a new wedding march. Here she is now, ladies and gentlemen, Miss Kitty Travers, the inspiration girl in person, singing America's number one hit tune on the parade of favorites, Kitty. That's how dreams are made. Travers. Affection, the hopes and schemes that never, never fade. That's how dreams are made. Hearts that be in sweet anticipation. With the dawn, you greet the whole creation. You feel the real, the things. Which you pray that's how dreams are made. In slumber you can number the joys in store. You borrow from the morrow in dreams, recalling parting kisses last night at the door. And now A lover, the happy future passes in parade. Thank you, Dan Barker. And now, could you tell us something about your plans for the future? Well, we're supposed to... Uh... We're leaving on a two-month tour. Personal appearances in the theaters and nightclubs. I'm sure we're both going to enjoy it very much. And after that? That depends on Dan. Well, I expect to write more songs. That will depend, of course, on my uh, inspiration. Don't worry, darling. I'll do my best to inspire you. Well, are you going to take that without a struggle? No. I'm going to fight for Dan. I'm going to fight hard. Linda did fight hard. She did everything to dissuade me, but I was crazy about Kitty. So we went on tour. I footed all the bills and paid Kitty a liberal salary as my inspiration girl. The tour didn't make much money, though. And the royalties on my one hit tune soon began to dwindle. What about your wife? Did you ever hear from her? Oh, yes. Linda wrote me regularly all the time I was on tour. She ever mentioned Kitty? Nope. Never a word about Kitty. Smart girl, your wife. Very smart. I didn't realize it at the time, though. I didn't realize just how broke I was either until I got back. I went to Joe's office. Bills, bills, more bills. Maybe you should change your name to Bill Barker. Tell me something. Have you an income I don't know about? Well, I guess I did spend a lot, didn't I? Like a Texas oil millionaire. Only more. So I'll write another hit. And you'll feel better about the whole thing. Look, I'll feel better if you write just half a hit. Tell me, how's Linda? Oh, I am. Uh, I don't know, Joe. I haven't seen her. I'm not living at home. Not living at home? Don't tell me. No, no, that couldn't be. Give up a swell girl like Linda for that, that inspiration, Dane? My personal life is none of your business, Joe. 
Don't say that, Sonny boy. My business got plenty to do with your personal life. Especially when things get so personal that you don't write no more songs and I don't collect no more 10%. All I'm collecting now are bills, and you ain't got no money to pay them with. Maybe you got a suggestion what to do about them. And I don't mean throwing them in a the wastebasket. I told you I'd write another hit, so stop worrying, will you? Then write it before the tenth of the month, please. It will make your creditors very happy. Inspiration, Dad. So you've come to plead for the return of your husband. You're wrong, Kitty. I'm not pleading. I merely came to tell you that you can't have Dan. What makes you think I can't? I know him. Much better than you do. Much better than he knows himself. Dan's a dreamer. All artists are. And infatuation isn't love. I suppose he loves you. Yes, he does. Sure. That's the reason he's been showering me with presents. I know all about that. I hardly think there'll be any more presents. What do you mean? Did you ever try to buy a present with a dream? Dan is broke, Kitty. He hasn't anything to offer you anymore. So you have nothing to offer him. Nothing to offer? Well, I like that. Who inspired him to write the only song that ever made a nickel for him? Answer that one, Mrs. Barker. You did. But he wrote a song for me before he knew you even existed. A song about real things. A song you could never inspire. That's how I know Dan will be coming back to me. Goodbye, Kitty. Coming back to you, that's a laugh, a big laugh. Let me tell you something. And while I was working, Kitty went out a lot with Helen, that lawyer, Crail. I must have been blind. I didn't even think anything of it when I saw this picture in the newspaper. The man with her here is George Griswold. He made millions building bridges. Here they are together at the 400 Club. Eye. You ask me, he's about ready to be hooked. I don't have to ask you, I can do it for myself. Only a little ahead of schedule. What do you mean? Kitty hasn't broken a thing with Dan yet. Don't you worry about her. She'll get rid of that broken down songwriter without a struggle. She'll marry Griswold after a few boring months, get a divorce, a million dollars alimony, and I'll get my cut. And I'll get mine. Don't forget, I arranged for her to meet Griswold. I think if I were you, I'd stop fretting about this deal and start worrying about myself. Meaning what? Well, I might as well tell you the day is waiting for tomorrow. You have picked up your last alimony check, Helen. What? <laughs> You're a great joker, Bert. No, I'm not joking. Your ex-husband came to my office a few hours ago with his attorney. Seems that the business goes into receivership tomorrow. There'll be no more money for you, Helen. He can't do that to me. He's doing it. Well, listen, you're my lawyer. You've got to make him pay. Did you ever hear the old expression, you can't squeeze blood out of a turnip? I can send him to jail, can't I? Possible, but not probable. You know, judges have a nasty habit of listening to both sides of the story. Of course, if you do send him to jail, you can always collect the $30 a month. They pay him for the work he does. $30 a month? Spend more than that on cosmetics? <laughs> what am I going to do? But you can go back to modeling. You're familiar with that work? Of course, it's not as much fun as picking up alimony checks, but at least it's a living. You listen to me, Bert. Here they come. <laughs> well, folks, did you enjoy your dance? I did. I don't know about Mr. Griswold. <laughs> George. Why shouldn't he? George is an expert. Thank you. I must admit I know good wine when I taste it. And a lovely lady when I dance with her. But at least it's more interesting than building bridges. <laughs> Let's say it's different. I think building bridges is very interesting. George told me a lot about it. Right now, I'm more interested in building a bridge to a fascinating friendship. Asking you for the last time, Kitty, where have you been? I hope it's the last time, because the answer's still the same. It's none of your business. 
You're not my husband, fortunately. Oh, don't talk to me like that, Kitty. I know I've been neglecting you lately, but that's because I've been working. Sure, and what's it getting you? Absolutely nothing. I'll write another hit. Plenty of hits. And there's a good chance now that the show may go on. Why, kid yourself, Dan. You wrote one song and it made a little money. But you haven't written anything since. Thank you. You're through. You're all washed up. You're a has-been. Stop that kind of talk, will Stop you? Stop being dramatic. It doesn't impress me. And besides, I won't take orders from you. It's awfully late. Why don't you run along home? To your wife, maybe, if she'll take you back. You're trying to tell me we're through? That's the general idea. Do you mind telling me why? You're right back where you were when I met you. You were broke, didn't have a dime, and you never would have if it hadn't been for me. Let's just say it was fun and leave it at that. I have other plans. Oh. Well, I suppose your other plans include this Mr. Griswold. And why not? Yeah. I guess he is the guy for you. You're so right. You know, Sonny Boy, there comes a time in the life of every agent when he has to tell the truth. Even if it hurts me. These appointments I'm used to for years because once I booked vaudeville acts. But you are the biggest flop I ever handled. And I handled some terrific flops including a troop of tightrope walkers that were drunk every night. Go ahead, Joe. Pour it on. Are you saying you ain't got it coming to you? No. <laughs> Passing up a fine girl like Linda. And for what? Everything's over between Kitty and me. You know that, Joe. It sure is, but, but what about Linda? <laughs> I don't think that she can live on air. Isn't she working? No, she's been depending on the money you sent her. Well, I haven't been able to send any since the royalty stopped coming in. The royalty stopped, but the money didn't. You mean you've been sending her money? Some people have to eat. Thanks, Joe. Yes, Gertrude? John Anderson is here to see you. Oh, I'll be right out. Don't go away. I got plenty more to say to you. Nothing like Kitty. I mean that uh, other song, but it will make some money. You know, Papa, being here tonight is my big regret that I never got married. I should have had a couple of kids, maybe. To carry on the agency. <sighs> Dan, I insist that you dedicate the lullaby to our son. What do you think? Promise? Promise. And here's another promise. Whatever money comes from the lullaby is going into a bank account for Dan Jr. And with the first money that comes from the show, I'll buy a really nice diamond ring for you, darling. Well, what's wrong with this one? Nothing. It's just a little, little, isn't it? I had it appraised. It must have cost George at least $5,000. Nice little anniversary gift, I must say. Mm -hmm. Wish I had a setup like this. Tell me, how does it feel being married to $40 million in 60 years of young manhood? Not bad. Not bad at all. Speaking of anniversaries, Kitty, 
Perhaps today would be a good day for us to talk business. What business? Oral agreement. Remember? I didn't expect you to stay married to Griswold as long as this. Perhaps you better stop by my office tomorrow and we'll discuss the details of your divorce. I'm sorry, Bert, but I've decided not to divorce him. Well, that's an interesting decision. Why? George is kind to me. He gives me everything I want without question. He pampers me all the time. I've grown quite fond of him. In fact, I think I love him. Oh, how touching. And how unfortunate that you'll have so many nasty things to say to him in the court. I told you just a minute ago that I'm not divorcing George. It won't take me more than a minute to change your mind. Nothing you can say will change my mind. If you think I'm giving up $40 million for my share of a million, you're crazy. But you promised us You that shut I... up. I want you to leave. Both of you. Before I call the butler and have you thrown out. <laughs> okay, Helen, come on. But the grand lady's bored with our presence. I'll telephone your old landlady, Ma Nesbitt, and tell her that you'll be coming home soon. Come on. Wait. What are you going to do? Well, it's not what I'm going to do. It's what your beloved husband will do. He won't be very happy when he finds out that you marry him with fraudulent intent. And that on occasions you're not above helping out in framed up divorce cases. Of course, if he loves you madly, he may forget and forgive, but I doubt that. He'll probably divorce you very quietly. And you won't get any alimony. Not a cent. All right, Bert, you win. No. No, you're being sensible. What do you want me to do? When do you expect your husband back? In three or four days. He's attending a bridge dedication in Ohio. Well, I'll tell you what you do. You pack your things, move out of here quietly tonight, and leave a note saying that your nerves are at the breaking point you can't stand anymore. Hold it. That would be desertion, and he could sue her for divorce. Oh, will you stop trying to be brilliant? I don't understand, Kitty. I did everything in my power to make our marriage a success. Yet she walked out on our first anniversary. I hate to say I told you so, George, but this fellow Crail is no credit to the Bar Association. However, a lawyer can't go any further than the client permits. So all of this must have transpired with your wife's knowledge and consent. It's hard to believe. But it makes sense. Mr. Griswold's residence. One moment, please. Mrs. Griswold is on the telephone, sir. Do you think I should talk to her? Why not hear what she has to say? Yes? Oh, George, I'm so glad you came to the phone. I thought you'd be too angry to even speak to me. I realize now how silly I've been, and I'm terribly sorry. I'd feel much better about it if you'd give me a chance to explain. I think you'd better do your explaining to my attorney. Oh, don't be like that, darling. At least we can talk it over. I don't think we have anything to discuss. Well, this isn't like you at all. You've always been so kind, so considerate, and now you're being cruel. I don't understand how you can call me cruel. Please, George, I've got to talk to you. Well, I can see you here tonight at 8 o'clock. I'll send a car to pick you up. That's very sweet of you, George, but I wish you could manage to come here. I'm really too ill to go out. Oh, I'm very sorry to hear that. Now, where are you staying? I'm living at, um, 487 West 82nd Street, the Derwent Gardens, apartment 5. There's a private outside entrance. I'll leave the door unlocked. You can come right in. Very well. I'll be there at 8. Mr. Healy, you have testified that on the night of April the 14th, you received a sudden call from the Ajax Detective Agency to proceed to the Durban Department. And there, from a proper place of concealment, take a photograph of what transpired there that evening. You did, in fact, take such a photograph. Yes, sir, I did. Is this a true reproduction or enlargement of the photograph you took on that occasion? It is. Thank you, Mr. Healy. Your Honor, I wish to submit this as the plaintiff's first exhibit. No objections. It will be admitted and marked as Plaintiff Exhibit 1. Uh, just a moment, Mr. Healy. You've also testified that on that night you saw a man enter the apartment. Yes, the man in the photograph. Will you kindly tell the court if that man is in this room? That's him. 
Would you stand up, sir, please? You are sure this is the man you saw? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Healy. You may cross-examine the witness. No questions at this time. Well, if the court so please, I should like to recall to the witness stand the plaintiff, Kitty Griswold. You will take the stand again, Mrs. Griswold. Mrs. Griswold, during your marriage, did your husband at any time have a telephone conversation with another woman in such a manner as to arouse your suspicion? No, but uh, he was away a good deal of the time, dedicating bridges and things. After you left your husband and took up separate residence, uh, did you ever telephone him? No, sir, I did not. Have you ever resided at the Derwent Apartments? Never. Isn't it a fact that on April the 14th, you telephoned your husband to pay you a visit at the Derwent Apartments? No. No further questions. Your witness. No questions. You're excused, Mrs. Griswold. Your Honor, please, I should like to recall Mr. Griswold to the stand. Mr. Griswold will please take a stand. Mr. Griswold, it has been testified here that you went to the Derwent apartment on the night of April the 14th, that you went there in answer to a call from a lady. Will you kindly tell the court the name of the lady who called you? It was Mrs. Griswold. Are you sure it isn't the lady in the photograph? I'm quite sure. <laughs> Mr. Griswold. And the gentleman in the photograph, is that by any chance a picture of you? No, it is not. <laughs> Mr. Griswold is one of the nation's leading industrialists. I take it you know the difference between truth and falsehood. I do. Do you know it is perjury to state as true a material fact which you know to be false? I do. I want you to think carefully before you answer the next question. You have testified that on the night of April the 14th that your wife telephoned you requesting you to go to the Derwent apartment. Now then, at any time during the evening of April the 14th, were you in the vicinity of the Derwent apartments? Yes. Isn't it true that you went straight to apartment number five to the arms of your paramour? No, it is not. I object, Your Honor. I object. I'm trying to intimidate the witness. Your Honor, I'm only trying to establish the fact that the defendant kept a love twist. The objection is overruled. If there's any further demonstration, I shall order the courtroom cleared. If it so please the court, we'd like to offer testimony and rebuttal. With the court's permission, I should like to call another witness. Why, go right ahead. Witness is excused. Call Mr. Curtis... Carter. He's trapped himself. He'll go to jail for this. Mr. Curtis Carter. Mr. Curtis Carter, please come to the witness stand. Uh, Curtis Carter, please. Now, sir, just when you're about to give truth, all truth, none but truth. I do. State your name. Curtis P. Carter. Take a stand. Mr. Carter, what is your occupation? I operate a poultry farm at Kingston. Are you quite sure your name isn't Griswold? Positive. Will you please tell the court, Mr. Carter, uh, have you ever been employed by George W. Griswold? For ten years off and on. In what capacity? Oh, I was paid to go places and pretend I was him. What sort of places? Oh, posing for pictures for newspapers and newsreel, things like that. Now then, Mr. Carter, were you employed by Mr. Griswold on April 14th of this year? Yes. I was paid to go to the Derwent Apartments and meet some lady. Did he tell you why he sent you instead of going there himself? Yes, sir, he did. And what reason did he give? He said he suspected a frame-up by Mrs. Griswold and her lawyer. I object. On the grounds of the hearsay. I make a motion that the answer be stricken. Sustained. Mr. Carter, do you recognize the man in this photograph? <laughs> I sure do. Will you tell the court who it is? That's me. Ain't a bad picture, either. Right pretty girl, too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Marriage is a sacred institution. It is not to be made the subject of mockery in the courts. Our alimony laws were established as a protection for women and children, not to be used as a racket in the hands of designing women and scheming lawyers. The bailiff will take into custody Mr. Burton Crail, Mrs. Kitty Griswold, and all others involved in this brazen attempt to subvert justice. You got me into this. Ah, shut up. Court is adjourned. <laughs> This way to the prisoner's train, lady. But I'm not a prisoner. Oh, yes, you are. Tell me, Dad, is Kitty still in prison? Yes, she is, Mr. Kramer. Who would ever think that of Kitty? It's a mercy my wife didn't live to see it. To think I came all the way here to take her home. I'll answer it, Dan. Oh, thank you, darling. Well, Mr. Klinger, I wouldn't... Hello? ...worry about it if I were you, because... This is Mrs. Barker speaking. Now that you're here, you can see her. I'm going to do her a world of good. You know that you're here. Yes, we'll come as quickly as possible. Kitty was paroled today. She's been injured in an accident. She's in the hospital and asking for us. Come on, Mr. Clayton. I didn't know where I was going. I didn't care. All I remember is gleaming breaks. I guess something like this had to happen to make me realize how wrong I've been. Please forgive me. It's all right, Kitty. I couldn't leave. You're hating me. We don't hate you. Thanks. You'll be all right, Kitty. I... I I'm going to be all right. You'll take me home, won't you, Father? Sure, I'll take you home, Kitty. I'll even fix up the old house for you. <laughs> we'll get rid of that green carpet you didn't like. I'll get Moha's old platform rocker, the one you used to like so much. I'll put it on the front porch. You can sit in the sunshine and get well again. I'll take awful good care of you, Kitty. You better leave now. She needs to rest. Goodbye, Kitty. Goodbye, Kitty.